We're especially glad to see all of the young people here this afternoon. On behalf of my colleague, Stephen Rothstein, who's right over there, <laughs> he moved seats on me, Executive Director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, I'd like to thank all of our library and foundation staff who are bringing our centennial birthday weekend events to you. Today's programming is made possible with generous support from Omega and the Richard Martin Foundation. So today is Space Exploration Discovery Day at the library, and we're honoring President Kennedy's contributions to space exploration. Now, here's a question for the young people in the audience. Can anyone tell me what his special contribution was? Yes. The moon. Yes, that's right. He challenged our nation <clears throat> to land a human on the moon by the end of the 1960s. So now we have a short video on the science and technology innovations that President Kennedy's challenge to the nation has inspired. His commitment to have us to go to the moon resulted in the creation of new technologies that we use today. Three, two, one. Off into space. We live in an age of movement and change, both evolutionary and revolutionary. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Three, two, one. The growth of our science and education will be enriched by new knowledge of our universe and environment, by new techniques of learning and mapping and observation, by new tools and computers for industry, medicine, the home as well as the school. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I, I wish I could jump like that. <laughs> While you're here today, uh, don't miss the space gallery exhibit in our museum that features the actual spacecraft flown by Alan Shepard, the first American in space, the Freedom 7. And you can explore our new centennial exhibit, JFK 100, Milestones and Mementos, which has a section on JFK and NASA. We now have a special greeting from NASA astronaut Jack Fisher, who couldn't be with us today but who wanted to send best, best wishes to everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm NASA astronaut Colonel Jack Fisher, flying 250 miles above the Earth aboard the International Space Station. To everyone at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum in Boston, greetings from all of us on board this magnificent international laboratory. I want to extend my sincere and heartfelt congratulations and best wishes to all of you attending this special celebration marking the centennial of John F. Kennedy's birth on May 29th. I vividly remember being there a few years ago for an MIT event and getting to see President Kennedy's Rice University speech in person. As he showed us that day and on many others, sometimes the power of words can transcend us all and truly change the world. As we honor the President's important contributions to the U.S. space program, I hope you'll enjoy learning more about our work at NASA today. And perhaps one day, one of you or someone you know will be part of the space program as well, part of JFK's vision for the future of space exploration. John F. Kennedy's vision and commitment led us to the moon. And today we honor him as we prepare to continue those exploits in our journey to explore Mars and beyond. And just to prove that we are in space, instead of just a simple flip, we have a special guest, a space ninja, and we are going to demonstrate a space ninja cyclone. Congratulations again and have a great event tonight. Today, we are honored to welcome back to the library two special guests who've come from the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, to discuss some of the work that NASA astronauts and engineers are currently working on. 
There will be a chance to ask both of our distinguished guests, guests questions following each of their presentations. Our first guest is Sue Curley. She is a senior double E, and I had to ask her what that meant. She says it's an electrical engineer. Senior electrical engineer who for 25 years has worked on designing, building, and testing electric power systems for space flight vehicle applications and life support systems for spacecraft and spacesuits. She's currently working on engineering for crew survival spacesuits and hardware. So please help me welcome Sue Curley. Thank you. I use him during my presentation, so I'm going to bring him over in front a little bit. Um, and just to let everybody know, Larry is an actual spacesuit. His parts were built for space, and many of his parts did fly in space, just not all as one big package. And so once things come back from space, because the materials, they can only be used for so long, and they can get worn out or just degrade, like your tennis shoes or your knees on your jeans when you're playing outside, once they come back because they're no longer safe, we kind of stop tracking him. So I can't tell you what parts flew where, but he is an actual suit and he has actually flown. But with that, let's learn more about suits, shall we? I'm a little bit challenged with the IT, I'm sorry. <laughs> Which is kind of ironic for a double E, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So let me ask, do you guys know why we make space suits, right? What kind of things out in space are bad for humans? You need air. What else? Yes, ma'am? Radiation. radiation, but that's a little less of a concern close to Earth than you might think. There's a couple big things. Yes, ma'am, back there. I didn't hear it. Well, no, that's OK, too. Any more? Any more? Go ahead and just kind of shout it at me. I'm having trouble seeing you. Pressure and temperature. So our big three that humans like, because right in this room, it's pretty comfy, right? It's just the right temperature outside. I'm from Houston. It's about 90 right now, which is a little less pleasant. Um, but out in space, it's cold or hot, depending on where you are. So temperature is a big one. And at the space station, temperatures can range between minus 250 degrees and plus 250 degrees. So if you step outside the capsule, you need something to protect you from those giant swings in the temperature, because humans function in a very narrow band, don't we? And even if you get to the outer ends of the band up here, sometimes in the winters, you don't function as well. And down in Houston, when it's 100, we don't function as well. So we want to keep you in the optimal range, because you work better for us that way. And then we have oxygen. We all need oxygen to breathe, to function as a human, and in space there's no oxygen to work with. And then pressure. The air pressure in this room, you guys are at sea level, we'll, we'll throw out a little bit of engineering, is 14.7 pounds pushing on your body in space, and the higher you go up, the less pressure, right? So if you're maybe mountain climbing in Colorado, the air pressure is about 10 PSI, it's hard to work, right? You get to the top and you're like, why did we decide to do this hike? I just need to sit for a little. But if we're sending you out of a spacecraft, we want you to be able to be useful for all those hours. So we need to keep the pressures comfortable for you, not only so that you work efficiently, but because you need that pressure to push the oxygen in your lungs to help make that exchange. And so pressure is very important. Now, pressure in the suit is different than what you're thinking about here. We'll talk about that a little bit, but I don't want to get too technical because you might all fall asleep on me. There's a couple more things that we need to think about relative to space exploration and going outside. One has to do with when you're going out in a non-gravity environment like the space station. There's all kinds of stuff floating around outside in space, isn't there? We've had rocket explosions and junk and all kinds of things. And so there's micrometeoroids, little tiny things and sometimes big giant things that are floating around. And they need to be able to protect you in case you get hit with something. Now, we don't send folks out on a spacewalk knowing there's junk around. So um, NOAA tracks the big junk for us and lets us know if there's a problem with things coming along. And the space station can actually change levels. I don't know if you're aware that we do what's called a pre-debris um, pre avoidance maneuver. If you ever watch the NASA channel and you hear a PDAM, it means basically you're on this freeway going 17,500 miles an hour and you've got a car stalled in front of you or actually you know, kind of coming at you pretty quickly. So you can either go a little bit higher 
and change lanes that way, or you can go a little bit lower and change lanes that way and get out of the way of it. So we don't plan our EVAs if we know that there's something out there that could be a danger. But our spacesuit can protect you if it does get a bit of a hole, about a number two pencil size quarter inch hole in it. The backpack, we'll talk about that later, has enough oxygen in it to give you 30 minutes to get back to your spacecraft if you get a hole of that size. The bigger the hole, the less time you have. <laughs> and then if you're on a planetary surface, kind of like going to the beach, and it's jagged, sharp little pieces. And so that kind of stuff can abrade your material. Again, kids, think of your knees after you've been playing outside on the playground for a while, or your elbows if you fall down at the end of jumping off a swing like I do. And so the spacesuit needs to be able to protect you from that, because this is all that's keeping you alive, right? So you don't want to rub holes in it either. I'm going to show you a video later of astronaut Charles Duke on the moon, and I want you to pay attention to the lower half of his spacesuit. It has something to do with what I was just talking about. So to know where we're going and, and uh, understand a little bit of where we are, we need to talk about where we've been. And where we've been actually has a lot to do with why we're here today. But these suits are very different from the suits that we fly now. So I want to show you how things have evolved, how we've engineered and changed things along our path and where we are and where we're going. So let's start with our Mercury spacesuits. Now, Mercury had three questions to answer. Does anybody know what when we first started all of this, what were the three things we were trying to do? Yes? Um, no, I, I don't know if there's water on Mercury, but that was not one of the questions we were trying to do. We had three big questions. Can any, does anybody know? Yes? Let me help you out a little bit. Can we send someone off the planet, right? Can we launch them in the space? Can we bring them back? And when they get back, will they be alive? Those were the pretty simple questions, right? <laughs> so the idea was to stay inside the capsule. But it's a new thing, you know, you're not sure if it's going to work. So you had a pressure suit that most of the time you would not be pressurized in. You wear it just like Mr. Cassidy's flight suit over here. Um, it's meant for to be unpressurized, to be sitting in your capsule, working at your controls the whole time. If it's pressurized, you've had a bad day and all you're trying to do is get home. So it doesn't have to be comfortable when it's pressurized. IT challenged. <laughs> so those suits weighed about 24 pounds and they were based off Navy um, aircraft, high-flying aircraft suits. Now, we flew around and, and brought them back safely. Right? So what's the next thing you want to do when you get to Gemini? Like, okay, we know we can get out there, we know we can get back, and we have a useful person when we get back. But now when we go out there, what do we want to do? Ah. Not yet. Can we go outside? Can we see what happens when we go outside of the capsule? And so, does anybody know who that man is? Ed White. That's right. Our first American spacewalker, June 3rd, 1965. Can you imagine being Ed White? Have you ever been on like one of those drop zone rides or at the top of a roller coaster and he's standing there going, okay, open that door. I'm ready to go outside. He's hoping our spacesuit works, right? <laughs> and, so, and so these were the same kind of spacesuits. He was used for both his pressurized, unpressurized comfort in the capsule, but now this suit had a bit of a new purpose. It had to be pressurized enough to allow him to safely be outside of the vehicle and have enough air and cooling, we used air cooling then, to survive for his 24 minute time. Now, he got his air cooling just like when inside, it was from an umbilical attached to the front of him. And so the air blows the oxygen in over him and he stayed reasonably comfortable in his overly excited state. Uh, we did notice, however, though, with the air cooling and his high excitement level that his visors were fogging a little bit. So air cooling wasn't quite sufficient enough even for activities of just going outside, not really even doing anything, but hanging out there going, this is so cool, best thing I've ever done. <laughs> and so these suits were a little bit heavier than the first suits because now it had to have the thermal and micrometeor protection on the outside of it 
to be able to help him when he goes outside of the vehicle. So those suits were more in the 40, 45 pound range. Now we get to Apollo. And Apollo's main mission was to do what? Go to the moon. And when we go to the moon, do we want to just sit in the car and watch what's going on? No. Do we want to be able to go out, right? But if you have a tether from your umbilical, you're going to be like the horse in the circus. But I want to go over there, right? So having the umbilical connection to the spacesuit wasn't going to be practical for what we wanted to do. So the Apollo created this guy on the back. We call it the backpack. It's the portable life support system. And it contains everything an astronaut needs to do up to eight hours of spacewalking activity. It has your oxygen supply. It takes care of your carbon dioxide and other nasty trash contaminant gases. It has, we switched from a air cooling system to a liquid cooling system. I'll talk more about this in a minute. So it has your water to be able to do the cooling. It has all your battery power and your valves and pumps and everything to control your suit and make you what we in the spacesuit business like to call a spacecraft for one. <clears throat> now this spacesuit here, this is the type we use on ISS. It's slightly different than what the Apollo suits were. They're very closely related, um, but not exactly the same. So that suit up there weighed about 212 pounds to go to the Apollo. So that kind of takes us, you saw how we evolved, and kind of takes us to the present. In the present time, we have two spacesuits. Well, really, the spacesuit on the left over there, um, that was our crew survival suit. And I talked about how the early suits um, they were meant for unpressurized comfort when sitting in a cabin, and that's a very, very different application than pressurized used outside the vehicle. And so the orange spacesuit that you see, our crew survival spacesuit, came as a reaction to the Space, Chal space, Ch space Shuttle Challenger accident in 1988. And our motto in the crew survival office is to give the crew a fighting chance. And so this suit was designed to be worn during the dynamic portions of space flight for launch and landing to protect for crew survival. And again, it's an unpressurized suit that is mainly used while you're sitting in your seats working in this closed environment. Now this suit had some extra, extra uh, features to it because we tend to launch from Florida, right, to get into our atmosphere. And if you're going to have an accident, where are you going to land? In the water, the Atlantic Ocean, right? That's why it's orange. Orange is an international um, recognized color for emergency, and it's also, if you guys are artists, it's opposite on the color wheel from blue. So if you're flying over in the emergency um, aircraft, you can see, more easily see, the astronauts in the water should there be an accident. It also had a parachute assembly, and we have emergency oxygen. So if something happens in your spacecraft and that um, systems get contaminated or you need to bail out and you're in an unfavorable oxygen environment, there are oxygen packs on either side of, I think they were here for that suit, and you pull your little green apple and you have 10 minutes of oxygen and help you get down to an area where you can sustain your life. Those suits have largely not been used now since the shuttle program has retired, but those are going to be making a comeback as our new um, survival suits for the Orion vehicle. I don't have anything in that um, in here today, but that's what I do in my day job is work on those suits and the other crew hardware for the upcoming Orion vehicle. The guy on the left is the one that you see all the time. How many of you guys watch the NASA channel? Oh, okay, so if you're watching EBAs, this is the suit they go out in, and this is one of those suits. So this is a microgravity EBA suit. And the reason why it's a microgravity EBA suit is because the lower portion is nice and soft. That's going to be a problem. <laughs> and look at the bottom of his boots. What does he not have? Tread. Because in microgravity, you really too active for this setup here. Um, you really don't use your feet. You don't use your lower half of your body at all. And so everything you do for spacewalking happens with your hands. That might work better. Is it already on? OK, thanks. So if you notice, he's got treads on his hands. Because everything you do to maneuver around, to work with your equipment, and everything is done with your hands. Your lower body just kind of comes with you. Now, the boots do have a feature on them. 
If you notice, there's a little metal clip here and here, kind of works like ski boots, and it actually attaches into a plate to help stabilize your lower body at a work site. The plate's called the Articulating Portable uh, Foot Restraint, APFR, if you hear that from the NASA channel. And that can help keep you in place while you're moving stuff around. You might see it on the end of the robotic arm if you watch for spacewalks, and your, your buddy can drive you over where you need to be and then kind of have some stabilization. Then we also use these tethers to help attach you to your work site to stabilize you too. And if you saw the movie Gravity, when they went flying away, these would keep you in place, not, well, we won't talk more about that. <laughs> um, Oh, I talked through those already. So let me, you see, what you see here is the outside. These are Larry's clothes. But Larry has stuff inside that you don't get to see. So we're going to take a journey on the inside of Larry. And the first part I'm going to tell you about, I'm going to talk about, is the liquid cooling garment. So we talked about how with Mr. White that the air cooling was not as efficient as we need it to be. And he was just out doing a spacewalk, just hanging out there. And the astronauts work really hard when we go out on EVA, so we need to keep them as comfortable as possible. And kind of like up here in the wintertime, you have lots of layers on your clothes, right? If you have to go out and shovel out your car, or for your kids if you're outside playing, and you start working harder and doing things harder, you get hot, right? So you start, you can unzip your jacket and take off your clothes, your layers. That's the, the astronaut can't do that, but the problem we have in the suit is with heating, because it keeps the temperatures from the outside getting to you. It's just as good as keeping the temperatures from the inside getting out, and the air cooling wasn't sufficient. And so this garment here has about 300 feet of tubing routed through it on both sides, and it plugs into the backpack, and cold water is routed through. It makes close contact with the body, and it pulls the heat off your body, runs it through the backpack that sublimates to space and makes it cold again, and brings cold, fresh cold water back to you. Now, this little dial here, I don't know if you can see, it kind of works like the dial on the air conditioning in your car. So you can dial in how much cooling, a little cooling or a lot of cooling that you want. Now this suit, this garment also does ventilation. You see this big tree in the back here? And there's tubes that normally run down the arms and the legs. You can see it on the example up in the corner there. And that's the ventilation thing. It kind of like works like the vents in your house. And so when we breathe out, we breathe out carbon dioxide, right? And that's really bad for you. What will happen in a short amount of time if you're breathing just carbon dioxide? Yeah, you, you basically will. You'll get really sleepy first, and you'll start to get headaches, and, and then eventually you will die. So in space, gases behave differently, and that bolus will just form a nice little bubble in front of your face, and it'll keep growing and growing and growing there, and it won't move. And so we need to have some way to get that away from you. And the way we do that <clears throat> in this spacesuit is the oxygen comes in at the back of your helmet and blows up over your head and pushes the CO2, your exhaled gas, down into the bottom of your suit to keep it away from you and give you as much fresh air as possible. Now, it's possible when you're on space station and you're doing other things that that bubble could then move back up. So what we've done is we put the returns at the end of your arms and at the end of your legs that function like that big giant vent in your house that takes all the air from your house back into your HVAC system. So the air returns from your extremities, which helps keep the gas mix and help gives a little bit of cooling. It goes back into the backpack and it gets cleaned up. The CO2 is removed and then other trace gases. And it's mixed with fresh oxygen again and put back into your system. And so it works just like those vents in your house the same way. If you'll see our lovely spacesuit engineer, she's wearing something that looks like just like the man on the other side who's Neil Armstrong. That's a communication carrier assembly. We call it a Snoopy cap because it looks like Snoopy and the Red Baron, right? when he's riding on his doghouse. This is the same technology that we use today that was used way back with Neil Armstrong because it's reliable and robust. It's got speakers in each ear, redundant speakers and redundant microphones. This serves as the communication for our crew to crew, crew to vehicle, and this is the system that we use. Now Larry over here, he's an interesting guy. Because he's actually got what we call the hard upper torso. That middle picture up there is what's inside of here. And that's the main structure of our spacesuit. And it functions kind of like armor. What do you have right in here? Um, 
What's, what's your essential parts? Heart and lungs. We want to keep those safe, right? And so much like armor, you have a protective case here that helps keep against the suit pushing in against you in the event of a really bad day. Um, it also holds the entire structure. It serves as the backbone for the suit. And so our hard upper torso is the main portion of the suit. The rest of these things all kind of just bolt on here. We have our pants and we have our arm sections and they're actually made of a bunch of different things. So I have a demonstration with the gloves. These are comfort gloves that the astronauts can choose to wear. They're very soft, comfy, com comfy cotton gloves. And really the purpose of this is kind of like your t-shirts in a hot day, right? To help soak up the sweat and keep you comfortable and not sticking to your shirts. And so they can choose to wear that underneath um, and pajama type as well. And this is the main portion of the suit. This is your pressure bladder or your balloon. This is all that keeps you alive, the main function. And these pieces are all through the different sections of the suit, and they hold the pressure of the suit. What happens if you blow a balloon up too high? It pops, and that would be a really bad day, wouldn't it? So we have what's called our restraint layer. This layer goes over top of the balloon, and it does exactly what it sounds like. It restrains it and keeps it to be the size that it needs to be. Now, the gloves are special, because remember, you don't use your feet in space. Your hands are the most important part. And fit is kind of important. In the early days of spacecraft, we knew who was flying, and there was only a few people flying. And so every suit was custom built to the astronaut. They had their main flight suit, a backup flight suit, and a training suit. So if you go to an exhibit and you see Ed White's patch, that was Ed White's suit, because there were three. When we moved to the space shuttle time, the space shuttle was going to be used to take things to space, to launch things in space, primarily what's floating over us that you saw two fish flying in, in the space station. That took us 15 years to put that baby together, and it was a lot of work, a lot of spacewalks to build that thing. And so when you have a lot of people, you can't build, it's not cost effective to build three suits for every one person. So the way we did suits changed, and this guy functions a lot like the clothes that you wear. So he has... Small, medium, and large, and extra large tops, and small, medium, large, and extra large bottoms. So if you have big shoulders and a small butt, you can mix and match those to help customize them to you a little bit. And we do, if you have longer or shorter arms or longer and shorter legs, we have little take-ups in there. But really, we had to sacrifice a little bit of the perfect fit in order to make it more cost-effective. So we have some things in there to help help size it a little bit better to you because the, the better the fitting the suit, the better, more able you are to work because you're not fighting. How many people make balloon animals? Okay, I know there's a lot of parents in here. How many people used to make balloon animals if you're, okay, or at least play with them? So, you know, when you have balloon animals, the more you blow up the air, the harder it is to bend the balloon, right? It wants to stay straight. And that's what happens with the spacesuit. The more pressure, the air pressure in here, if you're thinking of the 14.7 in this air, in the room, you wouldn't be able to move at all if that suit was at 14.7. And so we try to balance the pressure inside with movement. We run these suits at 4.3 PSI, and it's still fairly stiff, and it's a lot of work. You use your hands the most, and so we want to give you the best fit. So you'll notice there's little shoelaces in here that help tighten the gloves down to your finger lengths, because this is the most important part of you when you're on a microgravity spacewalk. And if you'll notice, there's a couple um, rings in here. Just like your balloon animal, it makes it easier when you take a little bit of air out or you put a bend in it, right? If you twist that balloon animal, then you've got a natural bend where, this, where it wants to, to bend and give you some assistance. We call those mobility aids, and we actually have those built into the suit in the wrist, in the shoulder, upper arm, and in the shoulder. And that helps, because now you're not just working in this small control panel, right? You have to be able to reach out and grab and build things. And so this helps not have to fight against that balloon so much and fatigue the people out inside. Now that's why I know this is a microgravity pant and not an exploration pant. This pant is all completely soft. And when I show you that video in a couple minutes, you'll see why we've needed to adopt some other ways to deal with this. There's another part of the spacesuit that we haven't talked about, and that's this panel right in here, our display and control unit. 
and it functions kind of like the dashboard on your car. It is the computer brains for the spacesuit. It has a little display up here so that you can see the functions of your spacesuit, how much oxygen you have, what your battery power is, what your suit pressure is. And so you can scroll through it, or it'll scroll through, I think, for you too. And you can check your, monitor what your suit is doing. It has controls so that you can talk to your buddy. You can turn your fan on and off, but we don't want you to do that. You can set your suit pressure. We generally do that before you go outside. Um, and so this is your, the brains of your spacesuit. I don't think you can tell from there, but if you come and see Larry up close, you'll notice that the words on the spacesuit are backwards. And if you take a piece of paper and you hold it up to your face about like this, do you think you can read the words on it? If you're looking out of this little bubble right here, you're not going to be able to see that. So we have a very high-tech device. So if you watch NASA.gov and you watch Spacewalks, you'll see the astronauts have these mirrors on them to be able to see what their suit settings are. And sometimes they, they're flexible. They're just on elastic band. You can wear them on either hand. You can wear multiples on them. So sometimes you're watching TV and you get a big glint of sun. That's what this is. It's the wrist mirror to help them be able to see. So I want to show you this video. This is Charles Duke, Apollo 16, on the moon. And he's trying to take a core sample, which means he's driving a hollow tube into the surface of the moon in order to collect sample of it, package it up, and take it back. If you will hit play for me. So watch. Now he's swinging a hammer at the plastic that's keeping him alive. Think about the balloon in his hands and trying to hold onto that tool the whole time. He's having a little trouble. Remember, a little bit limited mobility with the suit. You might not get the swing you normally would have. And he's struggling. Oh. What a bad, right. what a bummer. All right, so Mr. Duke's gonna try to, try to pick it up. Now notice how dirty his legs are, too. Look at how dirty the suit is. Okay, woohoo! All right, I didn't get it then. Let's try again. One more. All right, no, not joy there. Now one giant leap. Maybe a little momentum will help. Yeah! He's going to turn around and watch how far away he actually is. Not even close. Not even close. Now, Mr. Duke was a gold mine on the moon for us engineers. Um, not only is he amusing to watch, and he had some amusing commentary, although not in this video, but, um, and, and it was kind of frustrating for him too, but we learned so much. If you're interested, you can go to YouTube and go, um, type in Charles Duke on the moon, and he actually falls face down on the surface of the moon too. And it's amusing to watch him get up from that. And I know I've left you hanging. He does actually get the hammer, but in order to get the hammer, he has to go all the way back to his rover and get the fancy NASA trash picker upper and go all the way back over and pick up his hammer, and now he's got two things, and take his, hammer, or his trash picker up back to the rover, put it back, then go back and finish what he's doing. So our spacesuit design created a need for extra tools and a whole lot of time and energy spent trying to do something as simple as picking up a hammer. So this is not the right design for planetary use. One of the things that they could have done is put mobility agents in. And before I skip to the, move to the next slide where I talk about that more, let me also tell you about how we get into a spacesuit. Mr. Cassidy might have some good experience with this. The spacesuit is launched into space in pieces. However, the hard upper torso and the pliss are mated together. And if you see these little attachment points here, they're actually attached to the airlock in the space station. So it's hanging on the wall. To get into the spacesuit is a little bit of a process. I'm gonna have to set the microphone down for you. Now, I don't think you can bend your elbow like this to get in there, but you have to basically do a technique like that to get yourself into the suit. And then your buddy has to come help you put the rest of your parts on. And that is very complicated, and it takes at least two people to put a suit on. And we found that this very difficult maneuver 
of getting your arms through that hard upper torso was actually causing some injuries on some astronauts. So before we sent you out to do eight hours or up to eight hours of work, we were hurting you first, and that's not good design either. So when we think of things like Mark Watley and his three to four EVAs a day on the surface of Mars, if we want to have any chance of doing something like that, we have to, one, make sure we don't injure you. And two, we have to reduce how much time it takes to be able to get into a suit. You need to be able to get into it and out of it yourself, right? So as we work towards designing our new suits, these are some of the things we've had to keep into consideration. This was our first development model of a new suit designed for planetary use. We call it the Mark III. And um, it has some of the features that you can see. It has joints in the hips and the thigh and the ankle for being able to lift up your legs and move and grab and bend down and pick, down, pick up things. Mr. Duke wouldn't have had a problem picking up the hammer if he had that. We also designed a rear entry system. Essentially, this functions like a doorway. The pliss swings open, and the suit can be mounted to the spacecraft, and you can use a bar mounted over the spacecraft and slide yourself in, and then pull yourself out all in one. How many of you guys have seen the fancy Mars rover with the big glass front on it that NASA has? It's a really cool kind of vehicle. If you'll notice on the back of that, there are two suit ports hanging off the back that do just that. So I don't know if you were paying attention. I tried to guide you with Mr. Duke. His suit was completely dirty from here down with all those particles of the planet, of the moon on them. And just like going to the beach and you never get the sand out of your car, all of that stuff in the air in a spacecraft, your pumps and machinery that clean your air and your water and everything that you need to keep alive, that stuff gets all into that machinery and it's really hard to get out. And then you need to start thinking about, well, how many pumps? If I'm going to Mars, how many pumps do I need to take? Can I fix them when I'm there? What kind of supplies do I need to fix them? So you have to start thinking of the bigger picture. I can't just go to the garage and grab tools and fix something. So we have to figure out a way to keep that dust out as much as possible. And this design with the rotating backpack is one of those ways. And if you look at that rover, you can just put your spacesuit on and go up to your, back, or your rover and attach yourself to the wall. The door swings into the vehicle. You pull yourself out. Your suit's outside and all that dust stays outside the whole time. So that's one concept of a way to, to deal with that. And so those are the things we're testing over here. We like to go to the New Mexico desert because that's kind of like being on Mars to, to practice our spacewalking techniques. Oop, I think my advance is not working. Oh, there it is. So we actually tried monkeying around with some other things um, of not making it a hard suit at all because that can limit your mobility too. And so what if it's an all, all of a soft suit? So it's basically like your crew survival suit, but for exploration out on the planetary surface. And that works out pretty good, but it, um, it has its limitations too. If you fall down, you can damage parts. You can accidentally hit yourself with things and puncture you, and the structure of it is not as good. These suits we're working on, actually, we're working towards a higher pressure. So we worked this one at four PSI. That's quite a bit away from 14. We're looking at eight PSI suits, because that does a couple things. Astronauts now spend an ex uh, extraordinary amount of time having to do a pre-breathe, where they basically sit and breathe pure oxygen to help flush as much nitrogen out of their system. Because as you change in pressure, you have the opportunity to get what's known as the bends, decompression sickness. And so in order to help avoid that, we try to get as much nitrogen out as possible. But that takes a long time. And if you're Mark Watley and you're trying to do three or four EVAs at a time, that's a lot of time just spent doing a lot of nothing, right? And so if we can raise the suit pressure, you reduce the amount of time that you have to spend in pre-breathe. And also APSI is the level of working for decompression sickness. So if you have someone who's having that problem, you want a suit to be able to treat it before they even get back to the vehicle. So there's some advantageous reasons for having a higher pressure suit. And just the soft garment really wasn't quite working for that. So... This was our first official design of the next exploration suit that we're working on in our group. It looks kind of like a popular space ranger, doesn't it? <laughs> I, I'm told that was an accident. I don't know if I necessarily buy that. Um, but it got a lot of airplay. It was Time Magazine's Invention of the Year, I believe, in 2014. And while, although not pressurized, look at the mobility 
that suit offers. It's a hybrid. It's a little bit of hard stuff and a little bit of soft stuff. And so what we do as engineers is we, build a, we design a little, we build a little, and we test a little. And so we took him and we tested him in a vacuum chamber. So we basically recreate the environment of space and check the suit pressurization and check how it works. And then we also do things in the neutral buoyancy lab. That giant pool that has a space station stunk, sunk into it is a perfect place to be able to practice spacewalks. For an astronaut to, to go out and do a spacewalk, they have to have basic training spills, skills. They spend a lot of time in the pool. And then for every one hour of EVA activity that's scheduled for them, they have to perform up to eight, eight hours of that activity in the water. So they spend a lot of time in the neutral buoyancy lab in our suits. And so we practiced with this, and we learned what quite, wasn't quite working and what needed to be tweaked. And so that Z, Z2 is our newest iteration of this. And this guy arrived last year, and we are currently testing. In fact, he might be in the NBL this week. I'm not sure what the schedule is. I know it was right around here. Um, the one that you see on the other side, we crowdsourced this because we got so much um, public excitement from um, our Buzz Lightyear <laughs> that we decided, hey, you know what? Let's engage you guys more. There seems to be a lot of distance between us and you guys, and, and there shouldn't be. Um, you're all natural scientists. Any kid that's taken a magnifying glass and burned an anthill does what I do every day, right? You're like, hmm, I wonder if this will work. Let me test it. Yay, it worked. Or no, it didn't work. Let me try doing something else. I'll set them on fire with gasoline instead. <laughs> Don't try this at home, kids. <laughs> So you're naturally curious, you naturally want to know. And that's what I do every day as an engineer, and that's what we do with the spacesuit design. So we said, hey, let's get you guys more involved. So we hired, um, or we partnered with the University of Pennsylvania designers, and they came up with three cover layer designs for the suit. Now, mind you, the underwear part's still about the same, but it was the cover layer, the part that you see. And they came up with three ideas, and we put it out on the internet and crowdsourced it. And you guys picked Tron. <laughs> I kind of liked it, actually, myself. And so, just like fashion design, the real spacesuit is based off of the computer model. So that is the actual suit that came in. And he's being tested. He weighs. Now, this guy, fully loaded, is about 313 pounds on the ground. We have weight relief systems, and we use the neutral buoyancy lab to help keep the weight off the astronauts, but he's really darn heavy. And so, um, mass weighs a lot, or mass costs a lot to launch into space, and so helping reduce this helps reduce your overall costs. So this guy is more in the neighborhood of 200 pounds, kind of going back to the Apollo times, but with more features than what the Apollo suits had. And we're working on some other things, too. So, you know, we have these great computers in our pocket here that can do just about everything. And so wouldn't it be great if you're on the surface of Mars and you're going exploring, your buddy's gone exploring, and you turn around and you're like, uh-oh. I know there's a rover here somewhere, and I know Larry's off doing something. Let me look on my display and see where I am relative to him and my rover and my vehicle. Or what if you're on the surface of Mars and you're like, I like that rock. That's not the rock in my, dis you know, they didn't tell me to pick up this rock, but that rock's interesting. Should I pick this up? You take a picture, send it back to either your vehicle or mission control, and they come back and say, yeah, why don't you get that rock? And so we're working on technologies that take the things we work with now every day and make them into the space environment. So we're sort of working backwards, right? We've advanced in some ways more here than what space has done. And these are things we're working on towards in the future. So I want you to follow our journey to Mars. You can go to um, suit up at NASA and see what we're doing all the time with our spacesuits and keep engaged with us. And I hope that you found this useful and you learned a lot about spacesuits. I'm going to open up the floor to take some questions. There are a couple mics here so that you can ask some questions. I can't see real well because there's a lot of bright lights. So um, if you'll just sort of make your way up. Oh, that helps. <laughs> um, and then you can ask if you'd like to. How long does it take to put on a spacesuit? Well, it can depend. Um, spacesuits generally take, if you're, if you're a test subject like me, they don't take very long um, because I have a lot of people helping me. And so there's other people doing stuff all at the same time. Um, I think it's a couple hours to get fully suited up on the station, yes? Including the pre-breathe. Including the pre-breathe, okay. So it, it does take a long time. 
Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Um, well, is it comfortable to exit the atmosphere or enter it? You know, um, as far as, like, launching in a rocket or going outside the spacecraft once you're up there? Um, like, launching a rocket? Um, comfortable is probably a generous term. If you think about it, you're on a giant rocket with a lot of propulsion behind you. And so there's a whole lot going on as you're <laughs> strapped into the vehicle, right? So um, it's not really comfortable, and it's loud. Um. What? How long do you think it would, get, it would take to get to Mars? Six to eight months when it's on its closest um, part of the orbit to Earth. Um, why do they use rovers? Where's, who's that? Did we say you? Well, a couple reasons to use rovers. So robots are a great assistance device, right? They can do some things that you don't want to necessarily spend the time because humans take a long time. So sometimes you can send a rover out ahead of time to do some of the work for you. They also can handle like the environments for a long period of time and you get to study and see what happens to them over a long period of time so that you can work towards affecting what you're doing. And they're easier to change up, but they're, they don't quite do the same thing humans do. So you still need the humans as part of it too. What? <laughs> okay. What happens if you have to go to the bathroom? Oh, I was, I was saving that. So... If you ever take a long car trip, sometimes mom and dad don't stop, right? Well, in spacewalks, we don't feed you. We did try to feed astronauts. We put a, a bar on the side, kind of like a chewy bar. And if you notice, you can't really reach in to manipulate the bar. So it had to just kind of sit there, and they gnaw on it. And it was kind of sloppy, and you had particles floating around, and the internet just didn't work. We do, however, give you something to drink. So this is a disposable drink bag. And he actually goes inside the front of the spacesuit, and his little straw sticks up through the helmet. And so this is an astronaut sippy cup. He gets about a liter and a half of water for each spacewalk. And then when he's done, he throws it away. And everyone who wears a spacesuit has one of these <laughs> glamorous things. <laughs> now, you may think this is a diaper, but adult men don't wear diapers because that's not flattering. NASA calls this the maximum absorbency garment. <laughs> so if you hear them talking about the mag, it's official, it's their diaper. <laughs> and everyone wears a diaper. They don't all use them, though. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, so I have yes, a sir. question, actually. Um, Here, why don't you come over to the okay. microphone? You need to move over to the microphone. In the meantime. Um, so I have a very practical question. If you get a scratch, like an itch on your nose, what do you do? All right, well, the straw from the cup can be helpful. And there's also a, what's called a Valsalva device. So if you have to, when pressure changes, you can get pressure buildup in your ears. And so there's a little device in there to help you pinch your nose and breathe against it. And you can use the Valsalva to scratch your nose too. <laughs> Sometimes the ComCap mic because you can have this on too, can be helpful. But you're limited to what you can do with your head inside there, so. I gotta, I'll be real quick, I got a big general question. Um, you work in a community of people in various ways at various times that are the most informed, the most knowledgeable, and have the most sense of where the American space program is going. Are we going to Mars, and if so, when? That's an excellent question. Um, and, it, and it's unfortunate that it seems we've sort of been floating around for a number of years without really a destination, right? But we, like in my office, in my NASA, we are going to Mars um, in the 2020s. So the Orion capsule is the next capsule-based system to get us outside of the Earth orbit. It looks a lot like the um, early Apollo air spacecraft for a reason, because that shape works dynamically. And so that's the first piece of the puzzle to be able to get us to go other places. And we have a partnership with the European Space Agency to help build the uh, service module that's part of that stack up in the SLS rocket. And so all these pieces go together like Legos, and then we're working towards putting that together in a neutral um, area in space to be able to propel us to a Mars destination, which I believe is by the 2030s. Okay. Yes, ma'am. 
Why are spacesuits white? That's a really good question. Well, you saw the newer one, it was not white. Um, one of it, most of it is reflective properties. So when you're out in the sun, how does it feel in a black t-shirt compared to a white t-shirt? Uh, it feels... It's more hot in yeah. the darker colors. And so that's one of the main reasons for it. Um, and also it costs more to get fabric that's in multiple colors. Now we do put some color on the spacesuit. You'll see down here and sometimes up here on the portable life support system, a striping. This lets us know which astronaut is which. We call them EV1 and EV2 when we're doing two man and EV1 has the red stripes on them. And so they're sort of the leader of the spacewalk. Um, well, what about if it's cold, what would you do if you have really like light shirt and it's really cold. Well, remember, the problem with the spacesuit is not heat. It's not making you hot. It's removing the heat that's inside. And so it's more, there's more problems getting heat out. We don't have a thermal transfer from the outside necessarily to the inside. Now, I, I did not tell you, though, there is one part of the spacesuit we do heat. Remember how important your hands are? So we have found that over time, a couple of things are working against us. When you're in microgravity, all your fluids tend to be in the upper portion of your body, and you're not having gravity pull your blood to your extremities, so you don't have as good of circulation through your hands and your feet. And then you build up sweat in there. It's really hot. And you start sweating. You're working hard. And what happens when you're in a pool or a bathtub for a while to the top of your fingernails? They get kind of soft, right? And we found that with the gloves and everything on when you're working, there can be injuries to the fingers because of the softening of the fingernails. So we actually have active heaters on the end of the gloves, and that's what the little cable was for, and we have a battery pack on the back of the hand in order to be able to help try to dry up and warm up the fingertips. Go ahead. How do you know an astronaut is healthy in space? Overall, if he's healthy in space? Well, yeah. I think during when he's wearing the suit and out. Well, space. we do a lot with the communication. Um, and so you can tell a lot by a person from what they say or what they don't say. And so our astronauts, we have a medical team that uh, monitors the astronauts very closely or in co communication with them daily or as they need to. And then we have a whole team of people sitting, um, watching the EVA and work in the back room type of stuff. Um, when there's when the folks are out doing a spacewalk. So if they have any issues, they can make real-time calls as to what needs to be done. Um, when when you like put the joints of the spacesuit together, how do you like make sure like the parts where they connect are airtight? Fair, fantastic. How does the suit seal? Um, these have special locks to them and there's sealing mechanisms in between and they click into place so you have an idea when you've connected it well and then we do leak checks and pressurize the suit before anybody ever goes out when you're still doing okay to make sure you don't have any issues with your suits prior to you going outside and so we check all of those systems they also um, there's a monitor to be able to monitor your suit pressure so if you go outside and something happens maybe you have a, a leak in a seal and you start seeing your suit pressure decline you can tell from your little dashboard that things are not going as well as they should have been and in that case you just have to get back inside now if you have a problem that you don't have you have a big enough leak or you're, something's wrong with your system, there's a 30-minute air bottle in here, if you remember, or oxygen bottle that you'd kick on to be able to get you back. How much money does it take to get a suit? Suits, <laughs> suits are very expensive. So this guy's in the millions of dollars. Um, this personally one is not because he doesn't get to fly anymore. But um, each suit, because of the special materials in it, the special processes, and the flight uh, preparation for these things, they cost a couple million dollars a piece. And even the crew survival suits are on the order of $500,000 to $750,000 a piece. That's why we've gone to a much more modular system, because it's expensive to build them for each individual person. Um, why did when um, the first astronaut, when he put the American flag in the moon, why did it stay there and never come out? So why is it still stuck in the moon, or why is it still flying? Why is it still stuck in the moon? Well, the moon doesn't have any atmosphere. Right? So there's not, not wind and stuff to help blow it over or in any way disturb it from where it's been put. 
Thanks. Now, there's space junk and stuff that can fly around and hit it, you know, if, something, if there's a meteor that comes. But to my knowledge, it's still there. Okay, we have about five more minutes. Time for a couple more questions. Um, I was just wondering, uh, since you keep track of all the new suit designs, have you heard of the bio suit from MIT? I the have heard of the one. bio suit. Uh, mechanical compression is kind of like the holy grail of spacesuits, in my opinion. Um, because if you can get the bulk down and the weight down of a spacesuit, the advantage of that is fantastic. Um, the technology for mechanical compression type stuff isn't as advanced as what we have today, and it has some challenges. Um, how do you do the mechanical compression? If you use um, electricity or temperature to, to actually do the compression part of it, then what happens if you're in a highly changing thermal environment? Um, what happens over time as you compress and decompress that suit to use it? How, fat, how reliable is it? Will, how long will it work? Um, also things like, they call it second skin for a reason, because like your skin, it has to fit perfectly tight against you everywhere, right? How do you get into a suit like that? How do you move around when it's that tight against all of you? Because if you don't, if you have a spot where the suit isn't pressing, you're going to get what's called edema or swelling in that area, and I don't want to swell. So um, we actually partner with some universities, and MIT in particular, and we're working on mechanical compressions, but right now in the straight sections of the body, and maybe a hybrid suit is the answer, right? Use part air for the parts where you have your joints and mechanical compression for the straight sections. So we're working towards those answers and using high-tech solutions to try to figure it out. That's a great question. What's the new shoe made of? Um, it's made of a lot of the same things that this suit is made out of. So it's a composite structure for that hard portion. And the, actually, the fabric of this suit is made up of a huge number of layers of, of material. And so you have your um, urethane pressure layer. You actually have mylar, which is the same thing you have in your party balloons, your aluminum party balloons. It's got strings on the back for strength like duct tape. And then you have this Nomex Kevlar and Gore-Tex weave top fabric. So it's, it's a lot of the same materials. Um, sort of thinking like the Snoopy cap, if it works and it's robust, don't change it. But it doesn't mean we're not trying different things. If you want to stay at Mars, where do you live? Well, you'd have to make a habitat, right? And so just like staying in the space station, probably people thought that question 50 years ago was, was funny to laugh at. Um, hey, if you want to stay outside in space, where would you live? Oh, a big floating orbiting lab. And so it's the same thing. You have to build a habitat. We have an inflatable module right now docked to space station called the beam, which is one of the concepts. You could have a nice little packed thing like a tent. And then when you get to Mars, you inflate it. I think Mark Watley had that too. And so there's all kinds of ideas for ways habitats could be. I think we have time for one more question. Um, what happens if your suit breaks? So there's lots of ways it could break, right? Um, if you get a hole in it, if the seam leaks, if things stop working. So if you're out in space and things stop working, um, we have to figure out what it is that's not working first and whether it's important that you come back right away or you have a little bit of time. Um, and if it's a come back right away type thing, you generally go on to your emergency oxygen and we get you back in as soon as possible. Now, if you end up getting a really big hole in it um, and we can't keep suit pressurization, then unfortunately you're probably not going to make it. That's a really morbid way to end this. Let's try <laughs> one more question. <laughs> um, why do astronauts sometimes camp on planets? Camp on? Planets. Camp on planets? Yeah. Well, I think for the same reason when we landed on the East Coast, we traveled all the way to the West Coast. For the same reason when you say, oh, you know, I'd like to go there. I've never been there before. I want to climb that mountain. I want to dive into that cave. I think we're all natural explorers. We want to know what it is that's on the other side of that, right? And so who wouldn't go to the moon if they could? That would be fun to go play in, right? And so as, as humans, we just have that natural curiosity for, for exploration. And we have very brave people like Mr. Cassidy over here who are willing to sacrifice themselves to test it out and see what it's like going there.
So I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you for coming and seeing us. <laughs>